Hey guys, how are you doing tonight? Hey, good. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you here. So everybody, this is uh, John O'Donnell. John's going to talk some tonight about what he wrote his uh, master's thesis on, and we're excited to have him here with us for episode one of season two. And um, I was actually just uh, sharing with, with John kind of what our focus is as we um, hone in on some things. And here's what uh, Ryan and I have been thinking about, and it's this, that uh, the utilitarian nature, and that's a big word for, for some people, but the fact that um, some people want to make everything about producing something doesn't have to be what the human experience is about. Um, so we think that life is worth living on its own and that games and the connection that they can bring is worthwhile on its own. It doesn't have to produce something. Uh, it doesn't have to be commodified. And that's what we're going to kind of focus on in season two is things related to those experiences. So We'll have some fun with John and uh, see what <laughs> see what, what, what his uh, thesis might be able to, to teach us about that, or just we'll talk about some games. Maybe so, nail yeah. down reminding me on how to live. Say that again. Just nailing down, reminding me how to live and experience life. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's, I was making a joke. It's a worthless joke. <laughs> um so john um since you haven't been with us before do you want to give um an introduction of, about your work on your master's thesis sure yeah um uh maybe I, i'll just briefly introduce uh why i was doing a master's on, on board game at all um i uh yeah board game uh fanatic but uh um, for the last few years i i was a, an engineer uh, um, in a previous life a few years ago and I was just spending all of my uh, um, creative energy all of my time outside of work either playing games toying around with designs for games or reading about games and I just wasn't learning enough about it fast enough or wasn't uh, doing it fast enough I understand lots of people are designing games as as, as uh, their hobby and you know they do it as a hobby until it becomes their full-time gig but uh, I'm very impatient so I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to apply to a college um, and I did that uh, into the IT University of Copenhagen. So I moved from Ireland to Copenhagen to study games and uh, that's where I'm doing my, my master's in, in games in the design track. And we kind of study um, not just, so there's some other uh, universities that, that might, uh, uh, you know, study the, the craft purely of, of designing games. So like, making you into a, a triple a video game um uh, developer uh but the it university of copenhagen kind of has a different angle their approach uh, at least this is my experience is people play why do they do it um what are they doing when they are playing what do they play with and how is this changing over time um and i really really like that i, I thought that's like a sort of a fresh perspective um rather than thinking about what the status quo is at the minute it kind of helps us to understand uh yeah why are you know people having these experiences at all um so a lot of the it's an it university so a lot of their their uh, focus is on digital uh, products digital games apps um other digital toys uh, but i always wanted to make it about uh, board games and when it came to uh, master's thesis time they said you can write about whatever you want to write about um, I promised myself I wouldn't like over scope and uh, uh, but I yeah I, I broke that promise almost immediately and I tried to figure out why do people play board games at all uh, <laughs> so the, the title of my thesis is a uh, board game feel and uh, yeah it's really like trying to at least like find like a red thread in what's the appeal of board games what's like this uh, uh, why are why are we playing them what, what do we get from from playing board games i suppose yeah so if your if your question was i would explain my thesis i've done nothing so far only <laughs> get to what the what the title is <laughs> so how would you how would you explain why uh board games are important today you know given that we have apps 
and video games and everything else. Um, smart TVs that have games on them, even like what, why? Mm. Why do we need board games? At Absolutely, all? yeah, um, yeah. It, like, it, it's a really good question. I'm sure that's like lots of people think that we've maybe evolved beyond uh, uh, board games. We could, uh, uh, you know, when you're you're having that moment playing a board game and there's there's like some some chore that you have to do, restocking all of the tiles. I'm playing a lot of Castles of Burgundy at the minute, and when you have to like restock all of the tiles, you're like, this would be so much better if it was automated. Why don't we just automate everything? Um, uh, and and maybe that's what a, a video game would be. Uh, all of these automated uh, uh, activities, and the, the player just has these a couple of levers to pull. I think uh, why board games are like really relevant is that uh, when we play video games, the rules are like hard baked into the the video game. Like for most video games, you don't have a choice about following the rules or not. Like they're coded into the game. If you're playing a, a, a shooter or, or whatever, jump around game, racing game, you can't just like press the super nitrous button and wings grow out of your car unless the game allows you to do that. Um, I think board games, the rules only exist because we're constantly agreeing that they exist. Like we are the game really. Uh, 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 we like, there's the box of pieces of course, but the only reason any of these pieces have meaning is because we're constantly agreeing that, that they do. Um, and that might sound like not that important or maybe a bit of a heady argument for why board games are important, but it's like really active participation to make that game work. And I think humans nowadays more than ever are looking for things where we can have active participation with people like where we can have experience where everybody's involved in the, this shared context. We're not, uh, you know, having a conversation and I'm also on my phone or uh, yeah, I'm, I'm chatting to you, but I'm doing this other thing over here or, you know, we're, we're gaming and maybe talking about something else. We've got this sort of, you know, shared split focus. I think board games like give us like something central to focus on together. Whether or not we're doing it consciously because the game just falls apart if we give up on it. Like if, yeah. uh, you know, we give up on these rules. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's so a board game is a social. Sorry, go on. Yeah. Uh, a board game is a social contract, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. A, yeah. It's just a social contract. Yeah. You know? yeah. And then if people yeah. violate that social contract, you just don't invite them back to the table. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah, de definitely. I, I think that. Uh, uh, <laughs> So you, you guys will tell me to stop because I, I, this is like my favorite thing to, to talk about. Uh, I, I, I love when we say the word board game, uh, I found when I was doing the research for my thesis that we're not always talking about the same thing. Uh, if you have a conversation about what is a board game with somebody, and I really don't like definitions, I don't want to get into definitions. Um, but if you ask somebody, what's a board game? Uh, it's perfectly legitimate for them to say, pick up a box and say, here is a board game. It's also perfectly legitimate for them to say like, oh, I love the, you know, the, the game of Magic the Gathering or whatever. I like, I love this, this sort of formal underlying system of this game. Like that's also the board game. And then there's the three of us could sit down and, and play the board game. And that's sort of like the, the pieces and this system in motion. And, and that's also the board game. Or there's also like board gaming, the cultural uh, uh, artifact, I guess, uh, uh, like the, the, the cultural practice of, of playing board games. We are board gaming. I was board gaming last night. I'm hoping to board game this weekend. Um, and and that, that's been really fascinating to me is that, uh, you know, just reading things with a different lens of like everybody's using the word board game, but we're all meaning different things every time we're saying the word board game. So like when we say a board game is a social contract, that's definitely part of it. But a board game is also many other things. And none of them are right. All of them are just like, this is the limitations of this language that we've all agreed to use every day. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, it's especially interesting. I mean, it's the old Socratic question, right? Is, is this a chair? But it's especially interesting given that it is a construct um, where <laughs> it, that so much of the thing that we're talking about is 
in in the relationship and in the experience of what's happening um Mm. because it's a lot harder to point that out than it is to point out picking up the box and and pointing at that particular absolutely yeah and i i think that's uh, uh this like beautiful problem of of designing board games i guess as well is that uh, uh, I think you see this a little bit on, on Board Game Geek. Are we designing the experience first or are we mechanic first or are we theme first? And, and I think uh, it doesn't really matter where people get off on that train. But when we play test, we're definitely looking at the experience. Yeah. Of course, we might be play testing for balance as well or play testing of is the graphic design legible or did something offend somebody or... or did somebody get really excited about a certain character or a certain representation? But when we're playtesting, especially at the early stages, I'd argue we're looking for, did this, did this hook, did this catch people? Uh, like, did people care about what was happening in the game? Like, did this, is this social contract fun to enact? Yeah. Um, somebody was playing Fireball Island the other day and played that. Yeah, uh, well, actually, That's no, funny, yeah. I don't know, I haven't, but I, it's maybe some games that are similar. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. But, but I, I, I was thinking through that, uh, like you were talking about, um, like some people absolutely love that game, right? It, it, it's, a, it's a really silly, simple game, and they had good nostalgic experiences when they were younger that they bring, and they bring those to the table, and that makes it fun for them still today. Um, it's what I would call like a pretzels and beer type of experience. <laughs> mm. uh, I think dungeon crawlers can kind of be like that too. Um, while other people, because they don't either have that connection or they don't have a group that uh, comes with those types of expectations of, hey, we're just going to do this and it's going to be silly and fun, then they think it, um, it, can, it, it can be very polarizing whether it's a good or bad game based on those expectations that are brought to it. Um, mm. Have you personally ever had that uh, type of experience that that you uh, heard that the experiences related to a particular game were good, but then you got to it and you were uh, disappointed in what you found? Yeah, um, I mean, I definitely like, uh, uh, and, and maybe sometimes when people are amping up a game, uh, I'm also I'm, I'm maybe a little bit like going in trying to find faults <laughs> with it. Uh, uh, a little anti-hype train or maybe, I don't know, I'm a little bit of a hipster at heart, I guess. Um, Yeah, it's like definitely like putting this experience uh, uh, first and like hearing some people have good experience about games and and taking that at at its face value that that people are genuinely saying, I really enjoyed that um, has definitely made me reconsider games like you know, Monopoly or Scrabble or any of these games that that the modern hobby gamer might might scoff at um, for being bad games or that there are better board games out there. Uh, again, I bring it back to like, what well, what are you talking about when you're saying that it's a it's a good or bad board game? Uh, is it the production? Is it this system or is it the actual like uh, instance and in experience? And if somebody says they really enjoy playing a game how can you argue with that? Like, how can you, uh, uh, if they had a good time playing it, then I guess that was a good board game experience. Um, so it's definitely made me reconsider uh, uh, any of these like sort of mass market games that seem to hit with people. Because as you say, with Fireball Island, it has like this sort of nostalgic factor, uh, um, you know, maybe. Like maybe it's something totally outside of the the, the production and the, the design systems. Um, and I think games like these mass markety sort of games, Monopoly, Scrabble, Cluedo, probably hit those notes for people also. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I suppose people would be would be saying like, "Oh, what's the you know?" But but objectively, like that's a subjective opinion of of whether the game is uh, 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 good or bad. And I I really think that like objective arguments about if a board game is good or bad or. Uh, where, where does that that get you? Like, all that matters is are people enjoying it? Or... Right, yeah. I, I mean, we, we can talk about, like, how a point system works. Um, but what does that mean a, a, as far as what it means for something to be good? Um, mm. Yeah, it, it, 
or or whatever mechanic you choose, worker placement or you know uh, whatever. Uh, so what? Some, go ahead. I was going to say some life advice. If anybody hypes up a game for you and you play it and you hate it, um, I've found because people get really offended when you're like, "Oh yeah, game is awful." Um, the the softest blow that you can give them while still telling them that you don't like a game is I just really don't like that genre of games. <laughs> and, um, and that's like the easiest way to get around not really having to play that again. <laughs> just, you know, like it was good. It's just not my, it's not my favorite genre, you yeah, know? Yeah. <laughs> do, do, do and that you know, way, you know, there's no hurt feeling. Do you have games that you avoid, John? Um, yeah, I guess. Um, like I, I, I find <laughs> I'm I'm trying to be very careful to like not uh, not name names, but I think okay. that I, I I've just had like repeated uh, uh, bad experiences with um, sort of take that uh, uh, mechanics, <laughs> uh, and maybe that's another common one to. To hit on yeah. what you're talking about. <laughs> you're giving me the stink eye, yeah. Um, no, no, I, I know the game. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, like, I, I don't know if those those take that games were like. So I play a lot of uh, uh, Magic: The Gathering, and uh, I there's a lot of like a lot of the Magic: The Gathering decks I like to play, like have cards like uh, uh, murder in it or. Uh, like you know just directly destroy something and there's only two of us here so i'm going to directly destroy your thing um so that has uh take that take that mechanics as well so i don't know if it's like you know consistent that that take that is uh a thing that i that i avoid i i am noticing that like because it just in the the the, the notes you sent me ahead um one of them was about like my favorite uh game experience or my, my favorite game and and my favorite game to play is is heaven and ale i i love that game i would drink that up as soon as there's like a really good digital implementation of it i will just play that all the time and uh, and i love playing it with, with people as well i just love the puzzle of it um the production is really not that great the pieces are, are not that fantastic i've already destroyed my own version from playing it in bars um but the, the pressure that it puts on you to take a move and looking at other people and seeing the pressure it puts on them to take a move, that is just, I, I love that so much. It's like a beautiful agony, like this stress that you're under, that's, that's, your, that's the crunchy, juicy part of this game. But, but that said, I have had with my main uh, g gaming buddy who I was living with, uh, um, uh, now he knows who he is, <laughs> but we, we we've played it sometimes where i've taken a move and that has really ruptured his plans uh, i mean it was also good for me i wasn't just doing it to in, in spite of him it was just a piece that i rushed ahead these purple scoring discs if people are familiar with heaven and ale uh, rushed ahead to get one of those scoring discs and for the rest of the game he's like silent and uh that's like the game is like really hard for me to play uh, after that like we're still playing we're still taking our moves and it's a kind of a euro style game where we're all minding our own business but i'm no longer getting any feedback from him up until this point it's like oh you got that and you're paying how much for wheat or or whatever it is uh, um, i can't believe that you will uh, you know put that your water on the dark side rather than the light side if anybody's familiar with heaven and ale these are yeah genuine exciting points <laughs> um but yeah like if i like the game like had that uh take that -y sort of a moment and it just collapsed the whole house of cards and it then became a chore for him and then it kind of became a chore for me because we were no longer sharing the thing together again and i i don't think that's that's uh that's him i think it's like the the game has this you know is like on this delicate uh uh precipice of being stressful to being work almost <laughs> yeah um so you, you when, when you interviewed me you talked about pressure quite a bit um how did you end up defining that character uh, that quality within a game what, what, and what did you end up saying about it because uh, it's interesting how you, how you are using it in this case um 
where it ends up forcing a negative action with the person that you're playing with. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess it's uh, uh, that this sort of like breaking apart what a what a board game uh, is in in or how the word board game is used in language. Um, I see that like pressure could be in like a couple of different places. The 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 playing with the artifact that I call it, like the box uh, and the pieces, you don't really get a sort of a pressure from playing that. But with the formal structure of the game, you may get a sort of a pressure of like this sort of people might describe that game as being very tight or like in heaven and ale, you don't yeah. have a lot of resources. So every decision you make really, really, really matters. Um, and also the this sort of social aspect was the third part. So there's the, the artifact, the box, this like formal structure, and then this sort of social uh, part of the board game that you can have a pressure from that as well. Um, and I, I find that the more people that I, I spoke to that, the, yeah, this pressure was sort of acting in like uh, uh, two different domains, like the sort of like thinking what you're, the other person's going to do and uh, uh, then, yeah, as I said, like sort of reacting to uh, to what you're doing, that's a really important facet as well. Uh, let me try and stay on on point here. Uh, uh, how did I describe that uh, pressure? Oh yeah, so I guess like um, yeah, okay, that that pressure. I guess uh, um, when people would talk about it, is they were talking about yeah, interacting with like the puzzle of the game. And I think if you really want to see uh, um, that pressure like being enjoyable um in isolation of like all the social stuff and, and everything else that a board game might be is is to play a game with like a digital uh, implementation and to play it against the ais of the game so as i mentioned at the start i'm playing a lot of castles of burgundy but i'm playing it digitally because i can't meet up with people who play castles of burgundy at the minute of course and uh and i'm just playing that game again and again and again and again and trying to see like how much can I smash the AIs because the AIs are not very good. Um, but you're like trying to like eke out a, a strategy there and you're making the decision between, oh, will I take those cows or will I uh, go for the boats, which makes me be the first player. So then I'll be able to take the cows. There's a sort of a pressure um, from that, uh, that I'm like, I, I'm considering the other players as like uh, uh, agents, like their other entities in the game but really they're not like other other players um uh, yeah uh i'm sort of maybe deviating from what my what my focus on i thought that that pressure was was very very important um but i thought it was like not maybe the defining uh appeal of what board games had because you might feel that pressure in some video games in decisions that you might make in 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 sports as well in in, in other sorts of games uh that's sort of like the pressure from interacting with like the formal system of the game you might experience that in other forms um yeah for me what board game feel was or like this red thread of what board game feel revealed itself to be in my in my research was uh maybe not that pressure but rather this like social interaction Huh. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, that's a really long-winded answer. I'm so, no, so sorry. No, no, I, <laughs> it, it, it's got me thinking about lots of things. Yeah, um, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, the first thing I said was, if you're going to play Heaven and Ale, uh, if, if somebody's going to play Heaven and Ale, they should play Heaven and Ale with me because I get extremely animated when I'm playing Heaven and Ale. Um, and, and that's kind of like, as I've been hitting before, this sort of social interaction uh, uh, being board game feel or being like this uh, 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 yeah the, like the x factor of, of why we play board games that's why I would encourage people to play uh, other board games because when you play a game any game whatever it is let's get away from saying Monopoly is the, the starting point uh, um, if you play any game uh, it's going to set up some social structures between us um, uh, I will be against you and against Ryan. And uh, when Ryan does something, that will be good for me, bad for you, and all these sort of things. And if you play a different board game, it's those social structures are going to be totally different. 
if you've just ever played one board game, then you've just had one experience of, of how this could be set up. And uh, thankfully, we live in an age where there are so many games and so many ways to, for these different social structures to be set up. And I think the really uh, uh, useful analogy for me was uh, uh, that of a computer game. So I think I described it to you um, uh, before, Chris, that uh, when we're playing a board game together, I am the computer for your board game experience and you are the computer for my board game experience. And we all are uh, for each other. When we're playing a computer game, uh, uh, we you know, press the jump button and we see our character do an animation and he gets up and there might be a sound and then he lands on the ground with a, with a thud or a slide or a whatever terrain we're landing on. But you're getting all this feedback uh, back from the from the software and the hardware. That's the the, the computer uh, giving you this feedback. When we play board games, we rely on the other players to give us that feedback. Mm -hmm. And uh, the kinds of feedback that we get from different players is dependent on what these social structures are. And yeah, play lots of board games because they have lots of different social structures. That's why I like having an ale because the way it's uh, the way I care about what you're doing is so interesting to me. Um, if that's a good way of putting it, yeah. The way I care about what you're doing, yeah. Okay, I'm always trying to rephrase this as I try and finish up my thesis. Yeah. No, I I like it. Um, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about since that interview with uh, Cole is, is like alternative ways to win a game, um, and especially like there's tons of co-op games out there, but there's not anything where I, we both we both can truly win in unique ways there, there's nothing like that in board games yet um so i, I guess well I, I don't have a complete question from that yet except to say mm -hmm. have you thought about uh alternative yeah. ways to to uh, to win um because that, that that's one of the, the biggest critiques of board games is is that it can be very focused on the white male experience. <laughs> um, uh, there, there's an art article that's been floating out there for a few years in, in which it kind of focuses on, okay, so if, if you uh, do something in Victorian England where you're developing your factory, um, how does that really, uh, and then you win based on how well your factories do, how is that really winning for the local people who lost their their river and their their natural beauty of their land and everything else like it, it, it's, it's gliding all over that and i don't want to get into all that but i, I do want to say there's definitely different ways of looking at the world and, and you're touching on that right now with what, what you're saying especially on, on our social uh, relationships uh, there's different ways of looking at the world and there's different different ways that we can interact so how would you describe um either some new ways that maybe haven't been used in a board game or some of your favorite alternate uh, strategies for winning? Yeah, I suppose it, it's funny that like, uh, it's funny that that game is in the word board game a little bit. And because it is, we assume that there is winners and losers. And there's like a dominant way that we have winners and losers. And that's how many points did you get? And that's like uh, the, the uh, I was going to say dark cloud that's hanging over uh, uh, or that's like holding board games back a little bit um, that we think that they have to be games. Um, uh, so I would, maybe I can just like share a couple of anecdotes because I, I, I do think about this this stuff all the time. Just this evening, we played uh, uh, Telestrations. Um, uh, it's, uh, I mean, could you call it a board game? Of course, it comes in a board game box. And I get back to that old, uh, yeah. uh, that old story. Um, Telestrations, if people aren't familiar with it, it's uh, like the game Telephone. Um, if, if that you may have played as a child where you whisper something in somebody's ear and then they whisper it to the next person and they whisper it to the next person and then the message gets totally garbled. Um, Telestration swaps that out with uh, you try to draw a word, you give your drawing to somebody, they try to guess what that word is and then they pass their guess to the next person who draws that and then it sort of gets lost in translation. And what do you get at the end of it? Even the rule book says like points 
shouldn't matter here. We're all just about uh, having a laugh at this crazy journey. Um, and the way we played it was you put it down in the middle of the table and you saw it for the first time with everybody else. How did your word morph along the way? And the people who were winning were the people who were, I mean, we were all winning, but who was like getting the biggest laugh, who like misconstrued it. When my father was playing, he was like the speed bump in the in the communication pipeline. He would always like twist it in, in some way so uh, that it would turn out hilarious. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. Like nobody was, it was a, a, an experience we played together and nobody was asking about points or anything like that. In a more gamey context, I'm kind of plugging a game for a friend now, a uh, movable type by Robin David. He's a, a, a designer at a playtest group I, I used to be involved in in Dublin. Um, it's a Scrabble uh, um, uh, like game, a kind of a cross between Scrabble and Countdown. I'm, I'm butchering the sales pitch, but uh, uh, you're um, drafting letters to build words. Whoever gets the highest scoring word gets to take some letters and, and ultimately you're building your hand for the last round where you build some grand word. And there is a scoring system, but uh, when I ever played it, people like don't really care about uh, the, the points uh, you're getting. Yeah. And I think that's like a huge credit to the game. People are like, oh, what did you try to spell? You tried to spell elephant? That's a really long one. Like that was a long shot. You tried to spell elephant and what you got was pants. Uh, and uh, that's like, I think hilarious as well. Like that's like a, I guess a form of expression, but it, that those games sort of distance themselves a little bit from, uh, a little bit from winning. And that's my, my maybe hope for the future is that we all care about winning a little bit less, even in the putting in the designs of games. There has to be something that we're we're fighting towards, I suppose, uh, uh, to to get us all involved in the game. But uh, if we can make that as as little importance as possible, that would be great. <laughs> you have a question, Ryan? For um, I'd had a statement about alternate win conditions. Okay. I uh, I I went to a Magic the Gathering Pro Tour qualifier, two hundred and twenty people. And I went five and three for wins and losses, but I went eight and zero oh on hugs after my match. <laughs> nice, so, you know, because <laughs> it's not just and these are complete strangers, but it's not just about winning; it's about friendship and having mm. a good time. And so I won that day. I didn't place, but I, I won here. Yeah. <laughs> great yeah <laughs> yeah well, I, I mean it, 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 it is interesting how um the, the 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 idea of winning can 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 take over the entire experience for, for people um so uh sorry I, I'm, I'm trying to find something in my um notes but i don't know where i went anyways um uh, so what are you playing right now? You're playing Telestrations. You are playing Castles of Burgundy online. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, I'm playing it uh, online, but mostly I'm I'm playing it against the AI. Um, okay. I'm playing a lot of uh, the crew um, on on Board Game Arena with my friends. Okay. Uh, I I laugh because we we're like constantly starting uh, the crew and always getting stuck around like mission 12 or 13 so I'm not very good at the crew but I, I'm really really enjoying it uh, oh. we played that uh, over discord the other night uh, so we were all online and we just had such a laugh it was uh, brilliant because I guess with, with those games that have like no communication sort of communication rules start to appear right. and uh it's it's so funny when those rules you think that everybody's on the same page but one person is on a totally different page you ask them to explain their thinking out loud and they realize themselves that like yeah that doesn't that doesn't make any sense you're right i'm sorry <laughs> uh yeah it's a laugh uh the crew is, is very good at the minute yeah, yeah. i actually uh, my family don't really play uh um games that much uh, uh and the other night, it was like a Christmas present from my my sister to me. Uh, and she said, okay, John, you get one. Pull out a game and we're going to play it together. And I said, well, if we're going to play a game, uh, we're going to play Agricola. 
because I just want to get all the pieces out on the board and fill a table full of board game pieces. And she sat down, played Agricola, loved it. She said, John, pull out another game. We're going to play one more. And we played Isla Sky. And we played Isla Sky for an hour and or however long it took. And she says, would you mind? And it's like 2 a.m. now. She's like, would you mind if we played it again? And that was like amazing. That is like made my Christmas, made my year that I got to play uh, uh, yeah, board games with my family. <laughs> that's fantastic. No, I I love I love Sky. Um, that, that that's really cool. Uh, so, what? Uh, well, I'm I'm gonna do this now. Um, <laughs> O'Leary, you don't know what I'm doing. Uh, but uh, I have a like. Um, you get them from from like. Uh, what what are um, souvenir shops and stuff? And, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, I see it. The red, the red cross with yeah, the hand. It's hard to do back. O'Donnell. Yep. So that yeah. that's uh, the O'Donnell. But so, how do you say your name in Gaelic? Your your last name. Uh, O'Donnell. Uh, oh, it's just that. Yeah, O'Donnell. Yeah, yeah, Sean O'Donnell. Yeah. Okay, I, I I just didn't know because it was spelled completely different. That's why I was wondering. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gaelic, I think, uh, uh, or we call it a uh, Gaelga. Um, okay, is it looks a lot harder to pronounce than it actually is. Uh, but yeah, that looks like uh, O'Donnell on the chart, and, and that's what I go by on the streets. <laughs> oh, and Ryan, I guess th that's an O'Leary. Is that? Do you know what that is at all? Yeah, that's that's it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm. It's the Ryan's got a tattoo to his shoulder. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, you, you guys are, are, are way. Uh... I got I got it on the wall. <laughs> really? Wow. Okay, it's better than me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you you both uh, actually get your it's, family crest. It was uh, like a birthday present. <laughs> <laughs> um. So well, I've got a I've got a five foot neon sign that says O'Leary. From I my grandparents' dry cleaners. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's two, seventy two years old. For you, John. Man, I know it's really late, so I appreciate you staying up with us. Uh, oh no, worries. this has been fantastic fun. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, uh, I mean, the next one. So you're you're planning to turn your thesis hopefully into a book, um, or maybe with some other editors later on. Um, you didn't mention it, but I'm guessing maybe you wouldn't mind writing for like a, a uh, board game magazine or something like that. It would probably be nice to make something off your education too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm really like a, a fledgling um, board game researcher, I guess. Uh, I still have so much to learn, I guess, about, uh, uh, yeah, writing and all of this, like coming from an engineering background, this has definitely been a, a challenge to sort of get into the the humanities or this sort of pseudo psychology slash phenomenology whatever you want to call it um but yeah i'd be i'm i'm super interested in uh, um writing for for anybody who's looking for somebody to write about board games i'm definitely interested in doing that so on that point <laughs> uh where do you see the industry going uh like last night we were playing D, &D and then on a break mm. we, we talked about how like um uh, minis probably will be uh mainly home printed where you're just buying uh the the model to print from home in, in three to five years and <laughs> ryan doesn't think so <laughs> but uh you know there, there's definitely going to be change in the tabletop board game uh gaming community versus i mean there, there already has been compared to 10 years ago um in mm. Other things are, are huge now, where, but where as somebody who's going to be writing and making this part of uh, your career and life that way, where do you see the industry uh, going? Yeah, um, I, I I tried to come up with some ideas for this. Um, I I suppose like there's looking at like the innovations that are on. Uh, uh, Kickstarter and stuff at the minute, 
there's a lot of games on uh, uh, on Kickstarter. It's been like massive for for the industry. Whatever, like ten it was probably there ten years ago as well. I don't I forget how old Sai is, um, but uh, like Kickstarter has been a massive change um, for for the industry. And if but if you're looking at the games that are on Kickstarter, I don't know how innovative they all are. Like they're definitely innovating in that they're you know creating new representations the production quality is becoming amazing um and uh yeah these minis are looking fantastic the cards are gorgeous they have you know loads of different uh bits there um but again like this sort of social structure stuff uh, uh this uh what i found to be board game feel or what i think is a uh, board game feel i'm not sure if that's being innovated on uh every time so i think that there will be a revolution towards like simpler games um uh having like a, a, a yeah a great appeal i'm, I'm wondering like because you you see uh, even in the advertising language on kickstarter games it's like talking about oh for this money you get this many minis because maybe people they're marketing them to people who play dnd and it, it's a cheap way to get minis. Uh, maybe. I have no idea. That's a world I'm not that familiar with. Um, uh, or they'll also talk about like, oh, it's been like a, a super balanced or, or brand new mechanism. But you never see these Kickstarter games like uh, successfully or, or you never see them sort of like prioritizing this uh, uh, social uh, thing that 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 I think, I, I'm not sure if I'm getting it across uh, correctly tonight, but well, what I think people kind of agree is the the secret sauce of, of what board games is. It's like the X factor of like getting big reactions out of people when we're playing a game. That's a game that is really hit. Um, I don't see that being communicated well in these Kickstarter projects. And I don't see that being innovated uh, on, I guess, uh, bold statements for me. So... <laughs> I think simpler games that like sort of prioritize that. Yeah. Like the, like when the, the mind came out and I know the mind wasn't a Kickstarter game, um, but that's amazing. Like how did that only come out recently? And that's so, such a simple game. So that, that's what I was going to say. Like didn't Wolfgang Warsh design that one too? Yeah. 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 So he worked on Heaven and Hell, right? Oh no. no, that was uh, Heaven and Hell was Michael Kiesling. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Okay, but anyways, yeah. but but Warsh when he came out with that one, he came out with that one and Quack and yeah. Um, oh gosh, what was his other one? Um, uh, Ganshin Clever, right? Yeah, Ganshin Clever. And then the very next year, he had uh, his, his party game um, where where he. he, he you're getting within a range and it's really not about points, although you can pay, play for points. And oh yeah. Wa wavelength, right? Yeah. Wavelength. Um, and, and I think what's interesting about all, all of that is first of all, there's very little in common between those four games. Um, but they all, except for Ganshan Clever are really about mm. the experience. Um, so, so it, it, it seems like that's what, he focused on, and, and really for a lot of people, although it probably wasn't like this for him, but for a lot of people, he just kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's uh, amazing. And it, it looks like he's really like, uh, you know, onto something that he's really like found a thread that has quite a wide appeal. Um, like what he's selling there are really interesting experiences that are very different yeah. from one another and also very different from what's out there. Yeah. Um, so, but at, at the same time, I don't know if we're ready to pay good money for these experiences. W one conversation that I had um, in researching for my thesis was um, with somebody who's involved in the industry and they were talking about that you have to include minis in your Kickstarter game because that increases the margin uh, of what you can charge for it. So it, it feels like, okay, to boil it down, it feels to me that we're still selling plastic cardboard and wood. Um, whereas what we're really like, what we're actually selling is, is these experiences, but people are not prepared to pay money for 
those experiences. People are looking at what do you get in the box? The experience is, is free. That is a, a byproduct of, of the stuff we've, we've bought. So I, I don't know how we're going to make that jump. I, I think in, in like my, my, my late night uh, schemes to make my first million, I would look at what stuff do people have already from all the Kickstarter projects they've backed. You know, all the games, you see all these shelfies and all of the games that are on everybody's shelves. How could I sell those people games that they could play with the material they already have? Yeah. That sounds ridiculous. Nobody would pay for that. And that's, Some, I guess, um, part of the school. problem. What was that, Ryan? James Ernst did that in the 90s with cheap ass games. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, there was a, he, they were printed on like effectively pizza boxes and it just came with the rules board and then said, you should already own these things. Go get them from other games. Sure. <laughs> he doesn't do that anymore. Now it's, um, now it's more like market average games instead of cheap ass games. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, James Ernst. You're my hero. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. And I mean, it could be yeah. like, uh, uh, I, I would imagine that's like a, a barrier to a lot of people getting involved in a Kickstarter project is how am I going to take on this financial risk of producing all of this stuff uh, mm -hmm. um, halfway around the world and, and shipping it to all the different parts of the world. Um, but people have a lot of this stuff already. I mean, a lot of people. I, I realize I'm, I'm talking about uh, uh, a privileged, you know, percent in society which i i guess luckily i i'm part of i have a small collection of games also um but uh, uh yeah like people people have stuff you could make games for uh for that stuff but as i said i'm not sure people are willing to buy those uh yes people are maybe not comfortable with with buying just the the rules which is funny because people buy like one shot RPG campaigns, um, which is kind of what that is. Like, yeah. it's not really giving you any of the the stuff. You're buying a theme and some mechanics. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I'm a little bit wary about everybody having 3D printers in their house or everybody playing board games through VR. That that uh that might come. That might happen. But as somebody who was involved in 3D printing before, it, it takes a long time to print things. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. It, yeah. it has to get better. Uh, on the note of like games that don't have a lot in there, I, I bought this as a fanboy because I love Ooh. Tolkien stuff. Okay. Uh, we played it. We've played it three times in the last couple of weeks. It's silly fun. It's just a little pick up and deliver game. But, uh, my boys love it because it's simple and silly and like they end up singing the song um from the old ryan o'leary would probably know but from the old 70s um hobbit version <laughs> they sing that version rather than the weta version but um i, I the fact that it brings us together like that Dead the awesome. spoons crack the plates yep exactly <laughs> yeah i know that, that, but that's exactly what we we like about it and um yeah if there's a way that you can i think that that's what the board game tabletop community is working its way through is like there are a lot more um content creators that are in other fields that are way more successful relative to uh, physical production than there are in board games. Yeah, we have a few big names in board games and tabletop games, but we don't have near the same um, crossover. And, and I think part of the reason that there's that struggle is that there's still a, a uh, I, I, th I think you're exactly right. There, there's still a gap between um, the experience that some of us have had sitting down and playing at a table and those people who haven't had that same experience. And, and, and mm. finding a way to share that experience in a way that um, that makes sense without having to, to actually sell a, a physical product. That, that's really interesting too, yeah. Definitely, and I think you're, you're touching on uh, uh, like a really exciting point as well is like relatively, there's not that many people playing board games. Like 
to how many people are out there, how many people could potentially be playing board games. And I think we probably all know this anecdotally, where you you'll play a game with a, a non uh, somebody that's not playing board games all the time, and they'll really enjoy it that one time, but they're not going home and then playing loads and loads of more board games. And that's really exciting to me that like this uh, this industry, I think, is still on like a, an upwards curve. Um, yeah maybe, maybe it'll be in a different form because maybe it'll be totally saturated with everybody will now have all of the minis and all of the the cubes and and they'll just be buying uh rule books for me um but there's still like lots and lots of other people out there that are uh you know waiting to get into the hobby i guess or we're waiting for them to get into the hobby i'm not sure to say as a war gamer, I still want um, chits and tokens in my board games. Like I paint yeah. minis, I play with minis, but I, I think board games like Blood Rage would be just fine with chits, wood sure. cubes. Yeah, yeah. But you, maybe you have a, a more powerful imagination than uh, the rest of us. Some of us still need to be able to hold the. The big monster in our hands. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they add to it, but I just, I, I think it's just a, a marketing ploy to sell the games. And I don't think it, it can increase the experience, but I think some mm. games stand well on their own and it creates a financial barrier for people to experience the game because they're just pushing so much Ameritrash into it. Are we allowed to say Ameritrash? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but you you said it i didn't say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah um i i think i think you're really right and i i, I want to make sure i don't come across to say that like like minis are bad in games or, or anything like that I, I definitely don't think that's the case like uh, uh i have some games with minis in them and i really really like them a lot of that reason is because they have awesome minis in the game as well um but i uh i just see that that's where the innovation is at the minute oh cool yeah, yeah. Um, have, you, have yeah, you played bubble uh, only digitally. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another one that I got into. I hate it lockdown. digital. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hate waiting for my turn playing against the AIs. <laughs> I just want the AIs to be faster and faster and faster. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, other things to uh, to plug. Uh, not not really. I mean, I have a, a Twitter account that I post to sometimes. Jano Avocado, and uh, yeah. Depending on when this is out, my blog might be up online again, jano.games, um, okay. where I'll just be putting, yeah, some writings, some experts from my uh, from my thesis or ponderings about, about board games or sports or other things in games. So as you go back to, what is, this, this wasn't on the uh, stuff I say, what, what is the board game community during normal times? Um, what, what is it? Uh, I guess this is two part because what's uh, what's the situation like in Copenhagen right now? Here's the historical bit that hopefully in a few months this will be all behind us. But um, how, how's COVID doing? And second, during normal times, what is the board game community like over there? Um, COVID in in Copenhagen, I've managed to escape uh, back to Ireland for uh, uh, the the winter winter break while I've got some weeks off work. Um, so so that's been nice, just uh, staying out in the countryside. Nice break from the city. Um, Copenhagen, I think, has been uh, yeah doing reasonably well. One thing that makes me really happy about living there is that uh, test availability is like really 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 high. You can get a test and like five minutes notice um, without having any symptoms or anything like that, you're just concerned or you're concerned that you're going to be meeting somebody who is immunocompromised or something like that. Is it and I know cheap or free? It's free. Yeah, I, I had a, a lot of tests. Uh, um, and because they have uh, that, uh, that, that testing availability or that capacity, you're able to go out and uh, meet people like we did a, a um, Commander Legends Magic the Gathering draft um, and we all got tested uh, before the draft. Um, I was getting tested for coming home anyway um, and, and we could just do that. So we were still able to, to meet up. Um, but yeah, in very limited amounts. I mean, I still work from home and 
we try and do group shopping or or whatever. Uh, so yeah, it's still I think people are are, are taking it very seriously, and we luckily have a very good prime minister that's uh, uh, at least for 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 COVID is taking like a strong stance, and people are following a. It's a tough decision, but this is what we need to do to stop everybody from getting sick very fast. Um, so yeah, let's see how the the, the vaccine rollout goes. Um, during normal times, uh, board games are uh, yeah more normal maybe in Copenhagen than they were in Dublin. That's all I can really compare it to. Um, part of that might be there's a really big uh, cafe in the middle of Copenhagen that everybody should visit uh, when you go there called the Bastard Cafe. Um, so I'm not sure about swearing on this podcast, but that's, that is the name of the cafe. And uh, yeah, they have like over 3,000 games. You think of a game, they have it. And you can just go in there, get a bite to eat and, you know, get a game like uh, Agra out on the table that I've always wanted to play, but, you know, realize that if I buy it, I'm only going to play it once at home on my own. <laughs> um, so if I can convince somebody else to go meet me there, that's great. So they, um, that, that I think that having that cafe gives board games a really strong presence in the city. Um, you got a lot of people who are like just board game curious going in there. Um, there's a lot of good play test groups. Um, and yeah, I, I've definitely been to more than a dozen over my time living in Copenhagen, more than a dozen different houses who are having board game nights that are stretching into the wee hours. So there's a lot of people playing games over there, which is fantastic. And a lot of people happy to play test prototypes, which is, I'm very glad for as well. Yeah, it sounds lovely. I, yeah, we're very lucky over there. <laughs> I can't I can't wait to travel again some some year. <laughs> Absolutely. And you must let me know if you ever get over to get over to this side again. Yeah. Um well thank you again. Uh oh Larry, did you wanna add anything? Have any other questions or Nope, I'm just enjoying the conversation, or okay. listening, throwing in my sentence. Did you want to say anything about your favorite game there in the background? I know you already mentioned it once. <laughs> oh, man, my favorite game, Blood Bowl? Ooh. Yeah. That was my birthday present, the new edition. It's, just, it's the perfect game, you know? Just brutal, punishing, a um, lot of hurt feelings. It's everything I love in board gaming. Beautiful miniatures, halflings. It's, it's perfect. It's the perfect game to play with people and have everybody be upset sometimes. <laughs> so the, the opposite. I mean, I'm not even being sarcastic. I love it. You know? <laughs> yeah. People enjoy being upset sometimes. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, there's, it's the experience. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we have taken over about an hour, but real quick, John, it is, what, what are the feelings on, a, um, oh gosh, the, the, now, now I'm going to forget it. Uh, who makes Blood Bowl, Ryan? Games Workshop. Yes, thank you. Games Workshop. I, I'm the worst in the world at names. Um, what are the feelings on Games Workshop? Because it's very uh, divided sometimes over here in the U.S. Uh, on, on Games Workshop. Oh well, it's a, you're getting a bit of a biased answer. Like I'm a a, a 40k team. Uh, okay. Uh, I was <laughs> painting Tau and Space Marines. Um, yeah. Uh, but again, like you know, living in in rural Ireland, there was like two other people to play with, and when they stopped, I stopped. So. <laughs> um, yeah, it's yeah, it's lights. I mean, yeah, they make a, a a lot of mad stuff. It's just a bit expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> expensive I, stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I I didn't know if they they were it was uh, I, don't, I I didn't know if there were people that there that are like oh because they're British, right? Yeah, um, okay. yeah, they're over in over in the UK. Oh, okay, I I didn't know if it because I hear or at least see a lot on forums from some of the British players. I didn't know if people outside of Britain were like, we're going to leave 40K alone because they're British and they're going through the Brexit thing. Oh, we don't. Care. No, I, I don't think. I mean, if I could afford it, I'd still be playing 40K. Um, okay. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I haven't heard, I uh, haven't heard anything like that. I, uh, I yeah, uh, I'm all the best. If they can come out with a cheaper version of 40k, I'm all about it. Yeah. I good, good luck there. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Really appreciate your time, and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch. We'll be sending that. Um, sure. This has been great fun, guys. Yeah.